Hello, Rubis. Konnichiwa. Um, I would, do you hear me? That's perfect. Um, I would like to talk about parallelism and performance in Ruby today. Uh, and my name is Benoit Dalos, and I'm a student in Austria. I'm a PhD student. And I've been researching about concurrency and parallelism in Ruby. I've been working on Truffle Ruby. We'll see that in a slide on a, another Ruby implementation. Uh, and I'm also the maintainer of Ruby spec. It's a test suite for the Ruby programming language. I'm also a CRuby and MRI committer. Uh, so today I first want to talk about performance, and then I will talk about my own research, which is about parallel and thread safe Ruby. And first I want to introduce what is Truffle Ruby. Uh, so who knows Truffle Ruby in the audience? A little bit, okay, perfect. Um, so Truffle Ruby is a high performance, it's a fast implementation of Ruby, and it's done by Oracle Labs. Uh, it uses the Graal Jossi Time Compiler to achieve this speed, and it targets full compatibility with CRuby, uh, including the C extension. And there are two ways to run Truffle Ruby. Either it can run on the Java virtual machine, and then it's possible to interoperate with existing Java libraries, much like JRuby. Um, but there's also a second configuration, which is the default one, in which Truffle Ruby itself and the Graal JSTM compiler are compiled ahead of time to a native executable. So there it looks really like CRuby, just like a, a big executable with everything inside. And this mode, it starts very quickly, so it's even faster on startup than MRI, for instance. Uh, it also has fast warm-up, so the time to get to, to good speed is also reduced because everything is already pre-compiled, so it executes faster from the start. It also has a lower memory footprint than a typical Java virtual machine, and it has great peak performance, as we'll see. I want to talk about something else, uh, the Ruby 3x3 project. Uh, and the goal of this project is to make CRuby 3.0 to be three times faster than CRuby 2.0. And the way to achieve this, at least for CPU benchmark, is with a just-in-time compiler, uh, specifically MJIT. Now, this is a great project, uh, but I have two questions for it, which is, do we need to wait for CRuby 3, which will be in a few years, around 2020, and can we be faster than three times CRuby 2.0? And to answer this, I want to make a demonstration. Uh, I will run OPT Carrot, and this is the main CPU benchmark for Ruby 3 times 3. It's a nest simulator written in Ruby by MAME. Okay, so first, we will start by running it with 2.0. So here I have Ruby 2.0, because this is the baseline, basically. It's how, fast are, how faster are we than 2.0. So here I'm playing the, the Landmaster game, which is a default game of the simulator. Um, and as we see, the speed is not that great. It's around 28 FPS, so around 30 frames per second. But the next simulator normally run at 60 frames per second. So it's about twice too slow. And if we play a little bit, we see it's really slow. It takes time to, like for instance, just to move the cursor around it takes already a very long time. So we want to improve on this. Uh, so what we can do is we can try the latest MRI, which was released yesterday, uh, 2.6 Preview 2. And then we can run it normally here. And you see it's already faster. It's around 41 frames per second. So that's already a good 10 frames per second faster. Now, also in the latest uh, MRI, there's MGIT. So we can activate it with the dash dash JIT flag. And if we run it, Initially, we start at 40 frames per second, but it gets faster. It gets around a bit above 50 frames per second. So we're getting close now to what's the ideal emulation speed, which is 60. And now we can run it with Truffle Ruby. Like this. And there it starts up slower. 
And the reason is here, the JetStem compiler is warming up. It's learning how the program behaves, but then once it understands it, it will get much faster. So here it's terrible, it's seven frames per second. But here, soon after... <laughs> <laughs> And now we reach around 170 frames per second, 190, and almost 200. Maybe if I make the window a bit smaller. Oh, I started the game. Well, that works too. So again, now it needs to learn, oh, what, we, what did it do now? But it will optimize again very quickly. Uh, and so now I'm playing like really fast, right? <laughs> so this is quite tricky because I'm standing. <laughs> Uh, but I got good at this game uh, with trying it at the end. <laughs> so this is quite cool, right? Now I can really move fast around the board. And so the goal of this game, as you notice, is just to connect the different computers um, and to connect them all like a network. And it's quite tricky sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> How do I do this? <laughs> yeah, here's a trap, it should be like this. <laughs> okay, I still have 26 seconds, but actually they're no longer seconds, right? Because the time goes three times faster than normal. So it's like a third of a second. <laughs> I think it's very short. Okay, I think you got the idea, right? Uh, so if I stop it here in the end, we have like, yes, we reached like, for the last 10 frame, it was 170 frame per second. Uh, so that's a huge leap compared to uh, the 28 frame per second. That's about seven times faster. So what we saw here uh, is that the performance of a pit carrot is really great with Truffle Ruby. And so this green line is Truffle Ruby here. At the beginning, it needs to learn the program then we start the game, it's also confused a bit. But then it's really fast. And so we, when we run it, we thought the graphical user interface, we can reach almost 300 frames per second, uh, which is like five, uh, which is five times faster than the goal of Ruby three times three. And we see there's a huge gap with other implementations. So there's like something we do really better here. And this is what I want to explain today. Now this is just one benchmark, of course, but there are other benchmarks. On many of them, we perform well, especially when they are like CPU-based benchmark. Uh, and so this is some, a set of classic benchmark from the computer language benchmark game. And here we see we often get speed up from 10 to 30 times faster than Ruby 2.3. Uh, and there's a couple of exceptions like PyDigits, and this benchmark only computes big num, so it doesn't really exercise the Ruby implementation, just the big num library. So there we don't get any speed up. But for the majority of them, there is a very significant gain. Um, if we run MJIT, so MJIT is the JIT for CRuby, if we run their own micro benchmark, which were developed to assess the speed of MJIT and check optimization there, uh, we see we actually run it extremely fast. We run it 30 times faster than CRuby 2.0, while MJIT itself run it about four times faster. There's other area where Truffle Ruby is extremely fast. One example uh, is on rendering ERB templates, and I would guess it applies to also other templates. Uh, and they were about t 10 times faster than MRI 2.3. And the reason of this is we have a different string representation. This was explained by Kevin Menar two years ago at uh, Ruby Kaegi. If you, you can have a, a look later if you're interested. There's other stuff like eval, kernel binding, Proc and Lambdas, it's all stuff we do extremely well on, uh, but I don't have time to detail more in this talk. The, uh, the big question is, do we run Rails faster? And uh, the answer is not yet. Uh, so we are working on running Discourse and the Ruby Rails bench. Um, and so far, the database migration and the asset pipeline work, although they need a few hacks here, here and there. Uh, and so we need to integrate this hack properly and do the proper fixes. Uh, before we can really, like, everyone can try it, basically. And it's very challenging to run this course. Uh, so we have one person uh, working full-time on this now for, for a couple months. And uh, it has many dependencies, over 100 
and many of them at C extension. So we support C extension in general, and actually we already run like a few major ones like OpenSSL, SIG, Zlib, Syslog, Puma, SQL3, and UNF, and more. Uh, but it's still a challenge. It's, it's an active area of research and experiments because currently we need quite a few patches, so we need to, to change the extension quite a bit in a few places, and we want to reduce this because, of course, it doesn't scale. Ideally, we'd like that you just run any C extension and it just works on Truffle Ruby. Uh, but we still need work to get there. Also, we're making good progress already. So how is Truffle Ruby so fast? And there are mainly two reasons for this. The first is we use partial evaluation, which I will explain in detail. And then the GraalJIT compiler itself optimizes the code. Uh, as additional concern, just to give a bit of context, the core primitives, so like for instance, it, integer plus, are written in Java. And the rest of the core library is written in Ruby, much like in Rubinius. So here we have a small piece of Ruby code. And um, what it does is very simple, right? We have an array with one and two. We map, we map it and we multiply every element by three. So in the end, it should be three and six. And what every Ruby implementation does when it sees Ruby code is first pass it to some kind of tree, an abstract syntax tree. And so we see this foo method is translated to a small tree here. And foo itself, there is actually very little. There's a, only a call to map. And this call to map, the receiver is an array literal, one, two, and a block. Here, yeah, right? Um, and then we also have the block itself, for instance, it's a different AST, it's a different tree, it's a different construct. Uh, and that the block is very simple, it just multiplies the argument by three. Yeah, we'll try this. <laughs> no. Maybe not. Um, so in Truffle, we do this, but there's an extra thing, is we, do, we produce a Truffle abstract syntax tree. And the difference is every node in this tree is actually a Java object in everything from the node class. And, the, and every of these nodes has an execute method, and this execute method will tell how, how to interpret this node. So for instance, the mule node here um, just multiply its argument, so it executes both of of his children, and then just multiply them, return that. And we can imagine we actually also have a small abstract syntax tree for the map method. For instance, if it was written in Ruby. Uh, and there we see like, okay, there will be some node to read from an array, some node to build a new array, and some node to call the block for every element. So partial evaluation from like a more theoretical point here it's like we take the truffle AST of a given Ruby method or Ruby block, and what we get is actually a compiler graph um, representing how to execute the Ruby method. We'll see in detail in a second. And the process starts by uh, start from the root node execute method, and then we line every single method from there in this AST, and we perform constant folding at the same time. So this is very complex, uh, so I'll give an example. So here we have the AST of foo. And we start from the root node here. And what it does, the execute method of foo, the only thing it does is it executes its, ch its child. It executes the only expression in this foo method. And that's what I was saying with constant folding. We know right now we are compiling foo. And we know for that, because of that, we assume the AST cannot change. So this AST, during compilation, we assume it's like this. And so child, normally it's a normal, it's just a field of the node. But here, since we know this AST cannot change the recompilation, it's constant. So when we do child.execute during partial evaluation, we know the child is exactly this call node. And so when we, we call the execute method, we know it's a call node execute method. So then we just keep going on. Um, then we get into the call node, so a, a node to call a method. And the first thing it does, is executing the receiver. Again, it's a field, and we know exactly which object it is. It's an array literal. And so we execute this array literal. And this array literal is very simple. It just returns a new Ruby array, and it executes every value, every children node of it, and put them in a Ruby array. And it has two children. There's an int literal with value one, and an int literal with value two. And this one, the execute value of those, is very simple. It just returns the value 
which again is constant. Um, and so what we end up with is this code here. So for the full method, we took this AST and transformed into this. We transformed it into a compiler graph, but here I represent as Java because it's much easier to understand and read. And so we have some way to call a method. I don't detail that right now. And at the receiver here, we already know it's a Ruby array that, con that contains one and two. We know that we call the map method and nothing else. That's also constant. And we'll, the only argument we pass is a block. So if we do this for the other AST, we get something like this. So for map, we create a new array of the same size. And then for every element, we call the block and store the result of the new array. And the block itself only multiply by three. And for that, that first has to check, like, if the argument is an integer, then we can just multiply by three. If it's not, we need to reconsider. So what we do is we de-optimize. It means we get out of the compile code. Uh, we run a bit longer, and then we recompile with the new value. So for instance, if a float was passed, then we would do this. Now there's one, yet another thing that happens during partial evaluation. It's inlining between different ASTs. And so what we do actually is, already before compiling, we already track what we are calling. So this call node, it knows that so far, it only ever called the map method, nothing else. And this call block node, it only called this specific block and nothing else. And so inlining is very simple with trees like this. What we do is just change the shape a bit, and here we go. We have a huge tree, and so during partial evaluation, we'll actually compile this whole blob at once. And so we'll have more context and we'll be able to optimize further. So what we end up is this. So it's like the three methods we had before, but just in one. So everything is together and it can be optimized better. So at this point, partial evaluation stop, and the Graal just in time compiler kicks in and will optimize this further. The first thing it does is this array here. It notices that this array is actually never returned. Nobody uses it. Basically, we only read from it here, and we get the size there, but that's all. So actually, it removes this array allocation. There's no need to allocate it, because we know it will not escape. Nobody will actually use this array. So we get this. We replace the array, which is the storage. And the storage is just this int array. And then when we use to read from the array, we now read directly from the storage. And when we use to read the array size here, it's not just two, and we know it cannot change because we have an entire view. We know this array doesn't escape the compilation, and nobody writes to the side, so we know it will always be two. The next thing we do is know that we read from this array storage, it's an int array, so we do type propagation. So we know when we read here, we always get an int, so this check is useless, so we can just remove it. The next thing is more interesting. Now we notice we have a loop here, or the compiler notices, and it always does only two iterations. And these two iterations, they have a small body here in the loop. So we can actually duplicate them. We can unroll the loop. And we get something like this. So we just duplicated the body for every iteration. And this is, of course, more efficient. Now what we see is, again, this array storage, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just read from. And array storage zero, the compiler can figure out, well, that's one. And array storage one, it's two. So it just does that. Finally, we have this multiply exact. It checks that it will multiply this number. But if there is an overflow, it will throw an exception. There will be some handling for it. But in this case, we know that one and three, they will not overflow. It is a, a number that fits into a simple integer. So the compiler can just replace them at compilation as well. As a last step, we just reorder things so we can allocate the array directly with the right value. And it looks like this. So what we did is we took this piece of Ruby code and we transformed it into this compiler graph that is very simple and basically is already the answer of this. Uh, and then here, graph will continue and will produce assembly code uh, for the specific architecture. And you can imagine it's very simple. The only thing it does here is two allocation, and then it just writes three in memory, six in memory, return, and that's it. While in the beginning, we had like a call, calling a block, and many more complex things that would be much slower. So if we speak in terms of Ruby code, we optimize this to this, which is something we can do as humans very easily. But actually, to the best of my knowledge, only Truffle Ruby can actually optimize such a code. So if we look, for example, at MJIT, the method JIT for CRuby, 
Um, there, the first step is uh, the same. So the Ruby code is passed to an abstract syntax tree. Um, and then Angit, when it sees that a method or a block is called many times, it will generate C code from it. And we see an example just on the next slide. And then the C code will then call a C compiler, like GCC or Clang, to create a shared library. And then will, it will load the shared library. And what we will end up with is like the next time we call this function, we'll directly call this piece of assembly compiled by the C compiler instead of interpreting every single uh, node of the AST or bytecode. So bytecode is just a different representation of the AST. So we have the same code and MG generate code similar to this. So this is a bit simplified for readability. Uh, but so the full method itself compiled to something like this. So you create a new array here from these given values. And it will have to copy them, of course. And um, here it will call the map method. And the argument of the map method will be some block. And the block itself, it can also compile separately to some C function. And this one just multiplies by three. And then it's actually like they sugar directly into some, some code here. So it says if both arguments are integer, then I will just multiply them and check for overflow. If both are flows, I can just multiply them and return that, and so on. And if it's a case we didn't handle yet, that they optimize as well. So it means that we recompile with the new handling for the new kind of value. Now here, the C compiler kicks in. So GCC or Clang. And on this code, can I, it cannot do much, actually. The only one thing it can do is that it can notice like is three an integer, and obviously it is. And is three a float, and it isn't. So this branch we can remove, and this check, we don't need it. So we get something like this. But that's it. The compiler cannot go further because it cannot know how to inline this map method. And the reason is this map method, uh, it's actually like in C, it's called RB array map. Uh, it's part of the Ruby binary. It's just in assembly form. MG doesn't have the source of it, and so it cannot know anything about it. It cannot inline it. And basically, this foo and the block cannot be optimized together. So in the end, as the current state of MG, we cannot optimize this very well. We don't go much further than what the Ruby code did. Um, but of course, this might improve in the future. So what we saw here in general is the performance of Ruby can be significantly improved. And Truffle Ruby is an example of that, showing like we can get to really good speed. And actually, we can go, Truffle Ruby is uh, competitive with the best dynamic language implementation out there, like V8, for instance. So the message I want to pass here, there's no need to rewrite Ruby application in another language for speed. Ruby can f be fast enough. It's only a matter of the just time compiler getting smarter. One critical way to be faster as a JIT compiler is to have access to the core library, as I show with this map method. This is essential to really understand the Ruby code. And finally, there are some challenges. For instance, for MJIT, we need to teach the JIT compiler how to understand Ruby. We need to, to teach it Ruby. And for this, to understand the Ruby concept. So for instance, when we do a Ruby object allocation, at the C level, it just looks like we write some bytes to memory. And so the C compiler probably, at least initially, doesn't really understand this is an allocation. And so, for instance, if it wasn't used later, it cannot really remove that. Because it cannot know if another thread could read from it, for instance. So these are challenges. And so I think so all things we can solve, uh, but they're all things that are also important. They have really good speed. So this was the first part of my talk. And I want to talk about parallel and thread safe Ruby. And so this is the subject of my PhD thesis. So what I noticed and what I wanted to work on is that dynamic language, not only Ruby, but for instance, JavaScript and Python as well, have poor support for parallelism. They don't scale very well, at least in a single process. And the reason for that is due to the implementation. It has nothing to do with the language themselves, I believe. So let's be a bit more precise. So there are different kind of implementation. The first one is the global log implementation. And for instance, the reference implementation of Python and Ruby, so Ruby and C Python, they, are, they, they use a global log. And what this means is they cannot ever execute Ruby code in parallel inside a single process. 
the only way they have to achieve parallelism is to use multiple process or fork, which is the same thing. And this wastes memory because usually it duplicates a lot of the structure. And it's also resulted in extremely slow communication. The different process usually avoid communicating as much as possible because this is so slow. Then the second category is maybe more uh, interesting, let's say. Uh, so I call this unsafe, and I will justify it later why. Uh, but so JRuby and Rubinius fall in this category. So these two implementations don't have a global lock. They can execute Ruby code in parallel, but they are unsafe. They have problems. Basically, they don't have the same guarantees that MRI or CRuby provides. And so if we have a concurrent array app, and I will show in detail later, we see it can raise exception, which is something that is deeply wrong from a user perspective. Finally, we have a third category, and this is the shared nothing category. So in there, we have, for instance, JavaScript, Erlang, and the kills as well. Uh, and there, it's a, it's a different model. So we share nothing or we share little, uh, and so it restricts what you can do. So you cannot pass object or collection by reference between threads. You cannot pass multiple state between threads. And that's by design. There are advantages from that. But so the solution is instead to do some kind of copying or to only pass immutable data structure. And so Guild, it's a solution maybe for Ruby tree. And I want to explain a bit more what I think about it. So on the very good part, it's a stronger memory model. And because it has almost no shared memory, no shared multiple state, it has no low level, no low level data races. So this is great. This is more intuitive for the Ruby user. But on the other end, there's the capability which we are used to in Ruby, which is we can pass object and collection between threads or between multiple entities collaborating together, which is no longer possible with skills. There we have a choice to either deep copy it, and this can take a long time if it's something big, or transfer ownership. So we transfer an object between different guilds. But this doesn't work for sharing, because when we transfer, it's only usable by the destination guild. It cannot be used by the source guild anymore. So basically, it's no longer possible to share like a big data structure that is mutable between multiple guilds. It's also unclear how it will scale. Uh, part of it is this copy overhead. This doesn't exist in a sequential program, and now we have this extra overhead. Of course, this can be optimized to some extent, but still something that exists and is there. Um, and another thing is the only way to, to really handle shared multiple data is put that in their own guild. So the, a guild itself can have shared multiple data inside, but it cannot ever give it to someone else. Uh, and the problem is that if it, there is a single guild containing the interesting shared multiple data, then all guilds will likely access it. And since a guild only runs sequentially, it means they will, it can become a bottleneck. So scaling is hard, no matter the approach. Uh, so this is like for consideration for guilds. But even in other models, like in shared memory, it's not always easy to scale either, of course. A um, more important point, maybe, is that existing library using Ruby threads cannot just change thread.new to guild.new. That doesn't work. Um, so basically, they need some rewriting. They need some rewriting in order to cooperate together. Um, because it's a different programming model. It's called the actor programming model. And we are not used to it yet in Ruby. Finally, I think guilds are a complementary approach to what we have with threads. Uh, some problems, for instance, are easier to express with shared memory or with threads than in the actor model, but the opposite is also true. Uh, you can imagine some rendering, like we had in OPT carrot, maybe we can parallelize this. And we can say, like, we have this big picture, and we can say thread 1 does this part, thread 2 this part, thread 3 this part, thread 4 this part. And so we can imagine directly rendering to a big array. And this is actually something that is difficult to do with the guilds or require extra copying. On the other hand, there are also scenario where it's just easier to actually model it in an actor model. So I was calling Jeruby and Rubinius unsafe earlier, and that's a very strong statement, and I want to explain why. So here we have some Ruby code. So we create an empty array, and then we create 100 threads here. And each of the threads, what does it do is it appends an integer. Actually, it appends 1,000 integer to the array. Then we wait for every thread to finish, and we print the size of the array. So the answer should be 100 times 1,000 integer. It should be 100,000. 
And sure enough, if we run this on Cerebi with the global log, we get the right answer. Of course, we have no parallelism whatsoever. This thread executes sequentially, but we get the right answer. And that's very important, of course. On the other hand, if we run this on Jeruby, which executes threads concurrently or even in parallel, we get the completely wrong answer. We get some random number here, and what does it mean is that actually some of the append operation, they disappear, they got lost. And for the Ruby user, this is very hard to understand. Why should this happen? Or worse, maybe even, we get an error. And this is not only Jeruby, it's also Ruby, it's just a different error. And this is extremely ugly. Nowhere in the array append specification or documentation does it say, it might throw an error or it might not happen. No, it always happened and exactly one element, and that's the semantics. Now, of course, Jeruby and Ruby News don't do this for fun. They don't hate their user, of course. The reason they do this is performance. I'll explain that a bit later. Uh, but first, what, the, what Jeruby and Ruby News propose to work around this problem is actually either use a mutex or use concurrent array that's new from concurrent Ruby. It's a, it's a Ruby gem. Uh, and there, what, what they do basically is they synchronize on every operation touching the mutable array. Now, there are many problems with this approach. The first one is it's extremely easy to forget to use this mutex synchronize or to use concurrent array that's new. And people need to use this construct on every single operation or, on, uh, or every single array or collection that is shared or can be used by multiple threads. And this is extremely hard. When we look at the source of a program, it's not easy to figure out can an array used by multiple threads. For instance, all array in constant, in like in Ruby constant, can technically be used by multiple threads. And we don't want to synchronize all of that. That would be a huge overhead. A second minor problem is that the synchronization might be unnecessary. So for instance, on MRI, Synchronizing like this is not needed, and so it adds overhead for no gain on MRI. Also, both of these solutions, they prevent parallel access to the array of hash. So every access to the array of hash is sequential, and this is just because of the implementation of this mutex and the implementation of this. Uh, but parallel access is actually common in parallel workload, in parallel benchmarks. So it's something that this approach is not good at. And finally, I think this is the most important thing. From the Ruby user point of view, you didn't expect what I saw on the previous slide. And they expect that everything behaves similarly to what MRI does. And so for them, it's just plainly incompatible. It's something that is just wrong. As an example, for instance, there were quite a few bugs reported to Bundler and RubyGems because uh, Rumble and, Ruby and RubyGems didn't work on Jeruby and Rubinius. And the reason is because they, they are trade and safe array and hash. So no solution was to have this kind of code in Bundler and RubyGem, and this is just ugly and show really the limitation of this implementation. But as I said, we can't really blame Jeruby or Ruby News so easily. The reason they do this is they want to allow to run Ruby code in parallel, and it's extremely hard to have both thread safe and parallel collection. Um, so here's a big challenge in computer science in general even. How can we make collection thread safe and not have a single thread over it? Because we can make it just thread safe, that's easy. We can just synchronize around every operation. But if we do that, the single threaded performance of array and hash would be horribly slow. It would typically be more than two times slower. Uh, something else I would like also to, to talk about is we want to support this parallel access I mentioned earlier. So this is what I did my PhD on. I want to solve this problem. And I think currently there's basically no good solution for it. Now, this doesn't only apply to collection, it also applies to objects. Um, and so object and dynamic language are a bit like collection. They're a bit like hash table, if you want, but with more stable fields. Since they support adding and removing fields at runtime, and they can have an arbitrary number of fields, it means the storage for the fields and the values, it needs to grow. So for instance, if I have a 100 instance variable, then I will need to grow to, get, to have enough space to store all this data. And what we end up is, concurrent writes, concurrent instance variable set can be lost. Uh, so here's a small example, I won't detail too much. Uh, so we create an object and the first thread set, uh, so we suppose we have an accessor for A and for B, and set A to one and then A to two. And the second thread set uh, field B to string B. 
we wait for two threads, and when we print the value of A, we get one and not two like we, like we expected. And this can happen, for instance, on Rubinius. Um, and what happened is actually, yes, originally we had a storage and it could contain only one value. But we, we added this field B, and now we need a storage containing two values. And there's no other way than reallocating a bigger storage, taking a copy of the old one, and then storing the new value. But by taking a copy, we essentially take a snapshot in time of every values here, and we completely ignore this. And the idea I, I had and I worked on is we don't need to synchronize in some cases. We only want to synchronize object and collection which need it. And I do this based on reachability. So what I mean is like when an object is reachable only accessible by one thread, and we'll see how we track this later, it doesn't need synchronization. Because simply it can only be accessed by one thread, it cannot be accessed concurrently. On the other hand, if an object or a collection is reachable by more than one thread, then it will need synchronization. So we have something like this. We have two threads here, and the first one points to a queue, a message, a hash, a key, and a value. And the second thread points to a graph with a few node objects. Initially, these objects are all wide, they're all local, and they don't need synchronization. Now what happens if we put the queue, for instance, in a global variable, we will share it with thread two. And at that point, what we do is we mark this queue as a shared object, and we'll start synchronizing on it. But not only the queue, but also everything that is reachable from it, because now thread two can potentially access everything here. And the reason, for instance, it could pop an element from the queue and get this message and mutate it. Uh, so this is really like reachability. We like, as soon as we get a pointer to something, everything that from, else, from there has to be shared. And the way we track this at runtime is when we write to a shared object or to a shared collection, we also make the value we write into it, we also make it shared. So if we write to the field of some shared object, we will share everything here, so the hash, the string, and the object. And the same thing for collection. If we append to a shared array, then we will share this object. And if we add an, a, a mapping to a hash, we will share this foo and bar strings. Now, the advantage of this approach, really, is that it has no overhead over single trade performance objects which are local, which are wide. And actually, this is the majority of objects. In most programs, there are actually a few object and collection that are shared. And so we can afford there to have some overhead and synchronize. But for the vast majority, we don't need any overhead. And so what we get here is with this unsafe, it's like truffle ruby without thread safe object, basically. And green is the approach synchronizing on objects with using this sharing, as you showed. And we see there's basically no difference. Red and green are always the same. On the other hand, if we would synchronize all object writes, no matter whether the object is shared or not, uh, this is similar to what JRuby does, for instance. So JRuby uses some synchronization to, to avoid the problem on object. It would be much worse. You would see a large overhead even on single traded benchmark, something like up to 2.5 times here. And that's very bad, of course. We don't want to lose so much performance for thread safety. Now we can do the same for collection. We only synchronize if the collection is shared between multiple threads. If it's only accessible by a single thread, we don't need anything. And there we have the original Truffle Ruby and the Truffle Ruby with thread safe collection, essentially. And we see there's no significant difference. And the reason for this is this benchmark is single, a single threaded. So there's no shared object in it, so of course there's no overhead. I want to talk a little bit more about arrays specifically. So arrays in Truffle Ruby, but it's also in other dynamic language implementation, are represented in some kind of sophisticated way. So let's take an example. We start with an empty array. And actually what we say is that the storage strategy, like how we represent this array, initially it's empty. Just like we don't need any storage for it. We know there's nothing in the array so far. Then we, when we add an element, for instance an integer here, we migrate to the most appropriate strategy. So here we would migrate to an int array strategy. Then if after, after we append some kind of object, we would migrate to an object array strategy. Now the advantage of doing this, like object array can store everything basically. But int array is actually much faster. It's much more compact in memory as well. It means we can store integer in only four bytes. 
or in most implementations, it would take eight bytes or much more. Like if we have to box this integer, I feel it would take like maybe, I don't know, 30 bytes per integer, which would be too much. So this really allows compact representation in memory and fast access to the data. And when I designed my thread safe array or my shared arrays, of course, I wanted to support all operation. I want this to be transparent to the user, so the user doesn't notice that it's a shared array. For him, it's just, just an array, and that's it. And this is quite challenging, because on array alone, there's more than 100 methods, and then do all kind of funny stuff compared to, say, more static languages. So you can write in the middle of an array, insert an element, or remove from the middle. And this needs extremely complex synchronization to handle it. I wanted to preserve the advantage of storage strategies, like we saw on the previous slide. And finally, I also want to enable parallel read and writes to different parts of the array. So one thread can write to one part, another thread to another part, for instance. And this should work in parallel. And this is important for many parallel workloads. So what I designed is called concurrent array strategies. So we have the existing array strategies, and we add new concurrency dimension. And specifically, we have new, two new strategies. We have this shared fixed storage strategy and this shared dynamic storage. Now, shared fixed storage here, it only handles a subset of the operation. It only handles access within bounds. That's access like you would have on a Java array. Like, so you cannot change the storage, you cannot append to it, you cannot change the array size in this configuration. But on the other end, this configuration needs no synchronization and is extremely fast. On the other end, of course, I want to preserve all the dynamicity of Ruby. So I want to support this append and delete in the middle and all other operation. And in that case, we just migrate to the shared dynamic storage. And this one, it will use some kind of locking mechanism to synchronize everything. This will add some overhead, but will be correct in all cases. So if we look at the scalability of every read and write operation, of the index operation, and here we see we have a machine with 44 cores. That's quite a big machine. And we say this shared fixed storage, the dark blue line, scales perfectly up to 44 cores. So specifically here, it's around 44 times faster than on one core. And so what we get is we can read from an array 30 billion elements per second. That's huge. If you can process interesting user data, 30 billion elements of this per second, that's really fast. The other interesting thing is like all these other lines, they all use some kind of synchronization. Um, and there we see it's much lower like around three times slower, at least. And so that's why I have this shared fixed storage here, because this one is much more efficient, basically, if you use the array in that way. Um, and there we have different kind of lock. So the simplest one in yellow is the, it's essentially like the global lock in MRI. It's all like a mutex in Ruby. It doesn't scale, it just synchronizes access. So it's no faster on 44 cores than it was on one core. It's even slower, probably. Um, on the other end, what we did is we designed our own lock, this lightweight layout lock. And what this lock does is actually allow scaling for both read and write accesses. Uh, so, it, so here we see it, here it scales well, both on read here and on write as well. While other configurations are usually pretty bad at it. If we run a bigger set of benchmark, uh, like the NASA parallel benchmark, these are very old but they also use widely uh, benchmarks. They were written originally in Fortran, and that was translated to Java, and then later to Ruby. Uh, and here we run all of these three languages, and as well as the, so this is the unsafe truffle Ruby, and this is the thread safe collection truffle Ruby. The first thing we notice is between these two, there's basically no difference. They all follow each other. Here there's a little bit. But so here we can guarantee safety, and we can scale just as well as the unsafe version. Not only that, we scale just as well as Java and Fortran. This is a huge achievement. There's very few dynamic language that can claim the scale as well as Java or Fortran. So here we go to my first conclusion. And this is the Truffle Ruby conclusion. Um, so the point is Truffle Ruby can run unmodified Ruby code faster and uh, as fast as the best dynamic language implementation like V8. And we saw that earlier with the OPT carrot and other benchmark. 
And Truffle Ruby can also run Ruby code in parallel safely. So it gives similar guarantees to the jail in MRI. In some way, it could be considered a bug fix, a bug fix for the global lock, basically. Uh, something to notice is the thread safe array and hash I described are not in the master branch yet. It's something I will integrate this summer. I still need to write my thesis and do this integration. So in general, Truffle Ruby can run unmodified code faster, but it also can run existing code using Ruby threads in parallel, and there's no need to change your different programming model. So, you can, so when we will support Rails to a larger extent than most extension, you could just try running it on Truffle Ruby, and it will likely scale very well and give good guarantees, good threat safety guarantees. When you append to an array, no matter if it's appended concurrently or not, it will be it as you expect as your Ruby user. So here we go to my general conclusion. I already said the first point. The performance of Ruby can be significantly improved. There's no need to use other languages. As we get smarter just in time compiler, and Ruby, Truffle Ruby is an example of it, we can get really good speed. Uh, we can also have both parallelism and thread safety, which was something that just didn't exist before, basically, uh, and also having shared memory, right? Uh, and I showed how with this shared array. And there's a similar mechanism for hash, for instance. And we can all have all of this without single trade over it. So we can still access array and hash very efficiently when they are not shared as well. So what we get overall is we get to execute Ruby code in parallel with the most, threat, most important threat safety guarantees and scale to many cores. We are showed like to 44 cores, of the benchmark at least to 16 cores, and it scale just as well as Java and Fortran on those. Now you might want to try Truffle Ruby, and I would like to say, please try it. Um, and we're currently working on integrating with Ruby install, RVM, and RVM. Um, and so this will soon happen. We'll have a, a release uh, in a couple of weeks, probably, and then we'll send the patches to all these different projects and you will be able to just do this, try it, and then you can just change to one, to Truffle Ruby, install it and change to it, and then you'll be able to try it for yourself. And we'd love to have your bug report and issue and whatever you meet, and also like good, uh, like good results you have with it. Uh, so we are just on GitHub and you can just uh, file an issue there. Now Truffle Ruby is actually a small part of a bigger project. It's called Graal VM. And, uh, 1.0 version, the first release candidate, was released a month and a half ago. And if you are interested, you can go there to see more detail. Uh, what it is, it's not only Truffle Ruby, but it's also, there's also a JavaScript implementation and a Node.js implementation, as well as R, Python, and LLVM bitcode. And LLVM bitcode means we can execute C, C++, and Rust, and more languages. And all of this is in a single integrated VM. So what it means is all this language can interoperate and interoperate easily and very efficiently. They can just call each other directly, and optimization can go through different languages, which is something that no other virtual machine currently does. Uh, there is an open source, typically mostly uh, GPL2 uh, community edition, and there's also an enterprise edition. Uh, so Oracle Labs is sponsoring this and paying a team of uh, around 30 or more people to work on this. So of course they need to get some money from it. So they have an enterprise edition, which is suited to surprise more like enterprise workload and larger things. And that's it. Uh, that was my talk and I hope you appreciated it. Uh, if we still have some time, I can take a question. Thank you. Thank you, Ergun. Thank you for your amazing talk. I guess you have seven minutes for Q&A. Would you like to do some, take some questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. So please ask any question to. Okay. Yes. <laughs> the Let me go to the mic so um, everyone can hear. To the mic, please. Um, the peak time performance is very good with Truffle Ruby, but uh, the startup time is so bad, as you showed in the demo. So is there any broker to improve that, or is that we can we solve that problem 
with partial improving the partial evaluation strategy or something others? So what is so bad? I didn't hear it properly. Sorry. Uh, you said something is so bad, and I didn't get what you meant. Um, so I want to ask: the, Is there any blocker to improve the startup performance? Startup. The initial. Of Trophy Ruby? Yeah. Okay, so startup is good. Uh, I didn't show this, but. Uh, So it's like 30 milliseconds. I don't know. Um, so it's the so this is running the on the on the native version. Yeah, uh, but, but on the on the on the GVM version, indeed, the startup is not. No, so no. Good. Um, it's the kind of boot time, and uh, I yeah, the warm up is bad, right? The, some kind of FPS with opt or yeah. The performance so this is what we saw uh, actually yeah, earlier. Oops. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So here, right? This. Uh, yes, we want to improve on this. Uh, I think we already made some progress here. It used to be like take longer than this. Um, so this is running on the JVM because on this benchmark it, it achieved a little bit better performance. On uh, on the other configuration, the native executable is actually it warms up already a bit faster. So even on like on the official benchmark, there's only 180 frames, and actually we're already faster than other implementation. But we want to improve on this. Yes. Uh, it's something that's important. Like currently, I think loading code with Trophy Ruby is slower than it should be. So this is not nice, for instance, especially if you start a Rails app. And it's something we plan to work on and improve. Um, so that virus technique, basically, we need to, to speed up the interpreter and see what are the bottlenecks there and optimize what's currently too slow. But I think it will be the interpreter of Trophy Ruby is slower than MRI. And this is by design, because it records a lot of extra information. It records which branches are taken which condition, what are the type of the arguments, what is the value of the arguments to a method. And all this information is extremely useful at compilation time. But taking this extra information also costs a bit of time in the interpreter. So the idea is, of course, the JIT ideally finds out quickly what are the important methods, compile them to native code, and that this really runs fast, and that's the important part. But yes, warm-up is a very interesting problem for a just-in-time compiler. I'm sure you're aware. OK, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, one, I just want to say thank you. That's super impressive, all the things you guys are doing. Um, have you guys looked into using similar techniques to what you showed for doing implicit parallelism, similar to what has been done in some pure functional programming languages? Uh, currently, we, we didn't research into that yet. Um, I think it would be possible like, with IT from other implementation also to do this. I think a general problem with implicit parallelism, it's just often not easy. To, to make it work for a large number of users, usually like kind of pattern based or something like this, so it only works in specific cases, it can break easily. So that's, a, I think, a big challenge in, in general. Uh, I think, for instance, that, like in Rails, we don't need implicit parallelism. There, the parallelism can be per request per user or something like this, so that's very easy. But obviously, cases where it would be very beneficial. There can be some other form of parallelism, like, for instance, using uh, vector instruction on the CPU or even using a GPU directly. It was there, there was research in Graal to do this, uh, and I think there's currently research to do this with Ruby too, so that other ways to speed things up. Uh, if you have idea about this, please speak to me after, and we can discuss. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Uh, I noticed there are a community and an enterprise edition. Yes. Uh, is, uh, are the references already written in stone somewhere, or are you still wrapping up the, the model? All right, so this is on the, on the website, on gralvm.org, and there it's explained in a bit more details. I will send, uh, I think, yeah, basically I cannot describe much better than the website. Uh, there's some extra stuff for enterprise, like security stuff and so on. Basically, the community version is already as fast. The results I showed today uh, are basically all from the community version. Uh, so that's already pretty good. Any more questions? Ah, yes, Koichi. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. I have several questions, but I, I want to ask you two questions. Uh, first one is, uh, you, you show the uh, partial, evalu partial evaluation demonstration on your presentation. So you make uh, spe uh, Ruby special uh, partial evalu evaluation framework, or uh, you use some framework 
So you, you only need to pass the, the Ruby AST to the framework. So which do you use? The second one. So mm -hmm. this approach here, actually, it works just as well for JavaScript and all the other language we support. So Torfu Ruby is written in Java and Ruby. So the, Ruby, the Java part all looks like this execute method. There's some additional profiling. I didn't show for details. But. So the partial evaluation itself actually it takes like some the, the Java code of the AST interpreter. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't doesn't care about the language. So there are no and it just works for every language. Yeah, so they don't need to know the uh, Ruby specific uh, knowledge. No, the Graal oh. itself knows nothing about Ruby. It just is like oh, this is a, a truthful AST interpreter, and the code we have there is uh, of course to us to like make it optimized and make it. Uh, understandable by Graal. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually relatively easy. Uh, it needs like some technique, but once we mm -hmm. learn them, it's, it's quite easy. Uh, so actually, if you have uh, your own language implementation, I would encourage you to actually try. It's called the Truffle framework. It's on top of Graal and makes it really easy to make an efficient language implementation. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, uh, uh, at the uh, last uh, second part of your presentation, you show the uh, uh, threat safe, uh, maybe, with, we can say uh, thread safe container, so thread safe array or thread safe hash. Right. But we need uh, more and more uh, uh, synchronization for uh, to make a thread safe program. So, uh, so if we ha if you, oh, we have a thread safe container, but we need to mo uh, insert the mutex right. to uh, to make a transaction or something like that. So I right. think the, it is not enough to make it more easy. Absolutely. Uh, so there's something I should have mentioned a bit clearer, like. Of course, to, to make a program thread safe, it's not enough to make the container, like to make hash and array thread safe. Uh, and this is, just, this is the same on MRI, on Cerubi. Uh, so here we try to replicate the most important guarantees that the global log provides. And one of them was like this, for instance, this built-in collection, like array and hash, are thread safe themselves. But of course, nothing above, above it's your responsibility. Uh, this is just like, I don't think there's any technique to, to really address that. Um, so here we wanted like yeah, to provide a safe environment. And when I call like this other implementation and saves, because I think as a Ruby user, one of the biggest guarantee of the global lock is that <laughs> object and collection are automatically synchronized and they don't break when you use them concurrently. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Esther, I have another question. So how's the memory usage different between these implementations? Okay, uh, so actually on the, on the native uh, mode uh, here, it's actually better than on JVM. So on JVM is the typical JVM memory usage, it's a bit bigger than what you expect, especially compared to MRI. Mm -hmm. uh, currently on Substrate VM, I think at startup, we use around 70 megabytes of memory, so that's much more than MRI, but it's still kind of reasonable. The JVM usually use over two or 300 megabytes at start. And on the other hand, with the array we saw, like this entire representation, we actually use only half the memory that MRI uses to represent an array wow. with integer in it. So there are possible gains in there and optimization. But in general, like MRI also figured out, if we use a just-time compiler, we usually trade a bit of memory to have increased efficiency, increased speed. So indeed, the just-time compiler needs more memory than without it. Uh, but it usually pays off because your application runs much faster. But of course, it's no good like if you wanted to, I don't know, embed this in a tiny device, then it's probably not the best implementation for that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Aragon. This, is, this was a great keynote. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.